I just want to remind everyone, um, this is all due in part thanks to our sponsors, HackerOne, Fitbit, and Verscript. Colleen, want to take it away? Thank you. Thanks, guys. I'll try to be mildly entertaining to earn that from you. Um, so before I start on the agenda, I'd like to get into why am I here today? Why are you here today? So I want you to take a moment. I know it's really loud and there's spilled beer everywhere, but look around the room. Look at your fellow folks here. Thanks for taking pictures. Um, and you're probably going to settle your gaze on somebody who is another excellent security practitioner, just like you. Maybe this is someone who does excellent cloud security, someone who does third-party security, somebody who is an architect and helps with security. And everybody here does the job of security very well. We know that. <clears throat> but what happens if you're a good security doer and you do your job at a very hostile and fertile an apathetic environment. Has that ever happened to you? Yes. Yeah, some people look sad when they raise their hands. It's okay. We've been there. So if this is you, I'm here to persuade you to adopt maybe just a couple of my learnings that I got some beatings. Hello? Hello? Oh. There it is. Don't hit that, but disconnect it. Awesome. Sorry about that. Okay, so suspense. I am here to persuade you to adopt some of the things that I have learned that help me push past some of the really, really painful things that have happened to me at work. Maybe it can save you a couple days of heartache, maybe a year of heartache, something. And who is this for? Really, security professionals who are at startups, um, small companies or other companies who don't give a crap about security. Okay. So we're going to spend a little bit longer on part one, so I apologize. You'll be like, oh, part one, two, and three. She's spending a really long time on part one. Once we're done with part one, two and three are gonna, they're going to fly through. Okay, starting with um, do you have a program and or team? Is it doing anything? Do you have people? So. I'd even like to back up a little bit and ask, are you always fighting with your VP of engineering? Do people in the company tell you that security needs to be out of the way, that they don't want to hear from you, that they don't want to do what you say? Like if there's a little bit of antagonistic stuff going on, maybe it's not the right time for your company to go into this full force. Or um, maybe they're a little bit more receptive, but maybe your company has never had any kind of security incident and your execs are really annoyingly cavalier about that. Well, it's never happened to us. Why do we need to care? Why do we have to spend money on this? That's what we have cyber insurance for. So convincing them is hard as well. So if uh, you're in either of these situations, you can reevaluate and say, should I bug out or should I actually push forward? Should I try to do this? I'm here to say, push forward, make them do this. It's for their own good. All right. So forget the plan and the team first. You need to make the executives want security. They need to want you and what you're going to do because you're going to bring some pain. You're going to bring a lot of changes, but you're going to make things better. So you need to convince the execs because they control your money. They control your hiring. So uh, this is what happened to me at first, because I went to a small company, I'd worked at big companies before, and I tried to tell them, look, we've done this gap analysis, and you have a ton of risks. And we went through the exercise of prioritizing them and maybe thinking about, this one will take one year, this one will take two years, you each should hire this person to do this thing. And they were just falling asleep. In fact, whenever I would give them updates, they were texting, I'm sure they were tweeting, they were just not into it. And it was really hard to get my message across. And I thought, what the hell is it? Why don't they take this seriously? This is their company. Well, the problem that I was having was I was talking about security the way that I talk to security with all of you. We're security practitioners. 
we have this base understanding and some of us have this crazy calling where we might have trouble going to sleep at night because this thing didn't get done or there's a bunch of risks that haven't been mitigated. But um, some of these guys don't give a shit. You know, what do they really care about? They don't care about what you do, so you have to flip it. So I would say that, um, really, you need to make them care by focusing on the things that they actually are interested in. So number one, executives care about staying out of trouble. They don't want to be that guy, that girl, that company, whatever it is that screwed up. And the second thing they care about is making more money for themselves and the company year over year. Those two things really have to be underpinning everything that you say to them. Otherwise, they're just not going to give a shit. I'm so sorry. But that's why we have each other in the security community is to cry on each other's shoulders. But executives are like, money and keep me out of trouble. And money and keep me out of trouble. So when you're creating presentations for them and, you're, and you have poured your heart into it and you're telling them everything they need to do, you are solving it. You've given them a silver bullet. If you forget to turn it on its side, if you get to wipe it down with, and here's how you can unlock new markets with doing what I say. Or if you forget to put, um, and this is how you can stay out of the headlines. And here's a couple other companies that didn't do exactly this and they got in the headlines. You don't want to be in the headlines. So unfortunately, it seems manipulative, it seems pedantic, but you have to do it or I promise you they won't listen. All right. So now this is a little bit more like the relationship we have. It took a very long time. It was about two and a half years. Um, I'm sure they actually hated me. They probably complained about me behind closed doors. Um, and I know there was one person who was gunning for me for sure, um, but he's quiet now. And it is because we've been able to tie what we're doing as a team together to what we can get because of that. All right. Okay. So on the, on the part of keeping them out of trouble, because they're very, very concerned about this, execs, if they go looking for a job, it's actually very hard for them to find another job. For security people, we think, that's crazy. Like, if I quit my job today, my boss pissed me off, I'm going to go out tomorrow, and I'm going to make twice as much, better stock options, they'll be kissing my feet, I'll get a better title, etc. That's not the case for them. If they go unemployed because something really bad happens, it could take them six months or a year to find another job. So they must stay out of trouble. All right. So this fun photo here. Whose fault was this? Who blew it there? So. <laughs> ah, yes. OK. You want me to talk louder? All right. Is that better? <laughs> OK. Um, whose fault is this? Well, we all have our personal opinions on this, and I vacillate on it myself because it's that basic understanding. Don't you care about your users and security and your company? They do care about their company, but just in a different way. So I, I've, I've struggled with this because um, this person's VP of security tried to tell her things that were wrong, sent that prioritized list up there and said, we need to fix A, B, and C. And those things didn't get funded and they didn't get fixed. And that person left and went for a better job and a better title. But this problem didn't get fixed because if you use any Yahoo products, you suffered because things didn't get executed. So the way that I want us to operate is we as security people own the communications and the response that we get from the executives informs us how good of a job we've done. And the type of message that you put together, if it gets that kind of a response, you need to get some help on, on reconfiguring that message because she's not getting it. So we need to fix it, so she does. Private opinions aside. So assuming that you buy into what I said previously. How do we make them understand? We covered that they're a different animal than us. They don't care about the same things that we do. So I bet you've already done a gap analysis in your area. You probably have a prioritized list of if this happens and this happens and this happens, the company's dead. Everything's dead. We're all going to find new jobs. Well, did they ever listen to you when you presented that? Eh, maybe. They probably thought, you know what security people do? Security people scare people. That's what they do. Um, 
Well, what we had to do to make it seem like we weren't using scare tactics was we took that prioritized list, which we thought was just gold, and then we spent $100,000 with PwC buddies, um, and they did the same gap analysis. They went through, they did a, a maturity model, and lo and behold, ours and theirs looked so much alike. Um, I felt good spending the money, um, but the most important thing was when you have external validation of the stuff you've been saying all along, this means they can no longer ignore the problem. So once you have them on the hook, then it's your job to come up with and then fix these five things this year. It's going to require a team that looks like this and they have this expertise. Um, we're gonna need a budget that looks like this. This is the time to really ask for a big budget. Um, and then have the executive sign off. This is where they don't get to shirk their responsibility. They get to understand um, what the responsibility is, which means that they not only have to fund you, but if there are any conflicts, meaning you want a bunch of things to get fixed and then product or another team says, all these other things are gonna get done and you can't do your security stuff, they need to back you up. So you have to get their commitment. Um, then as soon as you have that in your hot little hands, Write up your job descriptions and get those jobs posted immediately. Find your security people. Okay, so getting your team together. As I said, move immediately to hiring your security people. And those people are going to lead remediation in the most critical areas that you have. We'll say you had issues with, um, maybe you're in Google Cloud or AWS Cloud, you have problems there. You need a cloud security expert and this person's gonna come up with a roadmap to help fix some of those items over the next few years. What if your AppSec is all over the place? Same thing, you need to find an AppSec person to come up with a roadmap to fix those items over the next few years. And your job is to make sure it gets rolled up and reported to the execs because if they signed a big check for you, guess what? Every quarter they wanna know, How's my investment paying off? Are we getting safer? Are we getting better? Can we get certified tomorrow? They'll start throwing that at you. Um, and a note about hiring. It's hard to find really good security people because they already have jobs. We already have jobs. And not only that, but through LinkedIn um, and here uh, next or tomorrow in RSA, people are going to be trying to pick you off, pick you off and giving you a better job. Oh. You have two years experience, do you wanna be a CISO? Um, <laughs> it's coming, it's gonna happen. Um, so it is hard because if you are trying to hire people for your company, maybe you have three security people, just three, it's really hard to get that fourth because chances are they're gonna to go to Netflix, they're gonna to go to Google, they're gonna go some someplace where you can't compete with the dough. Um, so I would uh, encourage you to hire internationally. And I made these slides kind of before some things happened. Uh, <laughs> whoops. Um, that didn't deter me though, because most of my team is from somewhere that is not the Bay Area. The whole world has security people who are interested in fixing things, building things, and, and making your company better. Um, really, it's you just, your job is to convince them to leave everything they have, rent out their home. <laughs> and come to a crazy place called San Francisco where the rent here is probably three times as much as their mortgage, wherever it was they came from. Um, but once they get here, there's so many interesting problems to solve. So um, again, once they get here, get them on their roadmaps. They need to start delivering. Okay, now you scared the hell out of the execs. Good job. You got the money and you got your people starting to flow in and make changes. What else do you need? Well, at least 80%, yes, at least 80% of what you need to get done depends on R&D, and that's just what we call, and some other teams call, your general engineer group. So it's like platform engineers, it's your DevOps engineers, it's your, you know, every single product engineer that you have. Um, most of the work is actually done by them. You're telling them what to do, you're showing them how to do it, sometimes you're baby stepping them into it, but they're doing most of the work. So. You can't afford an adversarial situation with your R&D team. And I know, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago when I started getting involved in security, uh, it was very adversarial. Developers hated security people. They saw us coming and they would start lying, they would start running, they just didn't want anything to do with us. They would cancel our meetings. 
Um, don't have that happen to you because you need them to fix stuff. They're going to fix your access control issues, your change control issues, um, testing, pen testing, everything. They're going to do all of that for you. Um, and one thing about engineers, engineers in general are, you know, they're smart people. They want to be known for high quality work. They don't want to be that dumbass that ships some code that broke something. They want to be the person who's efficient and has great code and people talk about them. They love that. Um, and also, uh, I found that they really are fueled by beer and camaraderie. And I've come to really <laughs> enjoy their company, personally. So make sure you regularly acknowledge their achievements and their accomplishments toward your roadmap because you're pushing them to do the things that you want. I would even say around review time, write something like a paragraph up and send it to their manager and say, I want this to be included in their review because this person's helped so much. Not only are they doing their day job, but they're really making sure this stuff gets done. All right, so this is kind of how we are with them. I did steal a, a picture from one of my friends here. <laughs> I thought it was so cute. Um, they do drink with us. Uh, they like us. And never underestimate the power of friendship because if they're pressed for time and they've got five things they can choose from on what to work on, if they like you better, they're gonna do your thing first. Okay, so continuing on the R&D part, um, to really cement the positive changes of your program, I would like you to roll out a security champion team. What is a security champion team? Does anybody who doesn't work at Twilio know what a security champion team is? What is that? Deputizing engineers to be responsible for security. That's right, ding, ding, ding. I have like a, a drink ticket in here, it's sweaty though. <laughs> you <Yeah>, okay? <laughs> I don't want your DNA. Um, yeah. So, again, since they're doing 80% of the, the work for security, um, you might as well make it official. These guys are, uh, guys and gals, they're an extension of your team, you know, and they will be for the next couple years, few years, as long as they can stand it. Um, might as well officially enlist them, create a page somewhere that says security champions with flashing gold things. Um, give things away to them, t-shirts, acknowledge them publicly, have their names listed. Uh, they need to know that they are not only appreciated for doing the work, but now with their names up there, they are officially accountable. Uh, another note about your champions is they will help get your roadmap items prioritized. As I mentioned, if they only have time to do one thing and they like you better, they're going to do your thing. Are they going to make it work? All right. Yay. That's all of us together. Okay. One last thing with R&D. Since you've been putting in all this hard work and assuming you have this great roadmap with all these different streams, you've been accomplishing things, sooner or later you're going to get to the point where you can go for a certification. This is the one that we went for. No, it is not the hardest one there is. There are much harder ones than that. But we actually got to a point where we could have an outside auditor come in, test our controls, and we actually passed. So awesome. Um, the best thing about it was that our security compliance person, who isn't here today, um, made up these really cool certificates, and he gave them to the champion folks, the ones who supported us the most, the one who put in the effort. Um, so it's not just security's game, it's everyone's game. Um, and a note about certifications, I actually was very anti-certification until a couple years ago. And when I realized that even though for us, and I guess for other people in general, year over year making your security at your company better, that's good. That's what we're here for. You know, last year's security sucked ass. This one was eh. Next year's even better. And the year after that's going to be great. That's what we care about. Other people don't necessarily care about that. They're like, good job on doing a good job. Um, what this does, now if you have this on your website, guess what? If somebody tries to cut your budget next year, and this gets in danger of being lost, your executives aren't going to be happy about that. Your salespeople aren't going to be happy about that at all. This becomes something that they want to keep. So a little bit of manipulation, a little bit of secret there. All right. On to the people part. Wrapping up. So is building a security team and culture at your company easy to do? 
Is it super easy every day? People come up to you and they say, thank God for you and your team and all the work you do. It's like tears starting to gather up. Like, what will we do without you guys? No. Most of the time, this is what it feels like. Oops. So all these wonderful security people that you have here, what's actually happening to them is that they might be suffering on a daily basis. These folks are far, not these folks, these folks are far from home. They're support people. And when they're having a bad day, they have you to console them. So you got to take care of them, especially the ones, if they travel the farthest, be the nicest to them if you can. Cook them dinner, buy them things, tell them they're awesome. Just spend time with them. People need that. Um, yeah, and someone once told me that, hey, grit and hanging in there was one of my best qualities and other security people who were good had a lot of grit. But it's the ability to take repeated beatings. So if you're relatively new to the security field, get ready. It's about getting punched in the face repeatedly and coming back and going, you know what? You didn't punch the other side of my face, so let's make it even. That's what the job is. That's why we have to be here for each other. <laughs> I'm not joking. All right. So this is really how the job feels. It's either pulling teeth, right? You're pulling teeth to get people to do things, or you're taking a beating. This is the one that I feel like most of the time, probably every Wednesday when we have ops review. Like, I'm just ready for it. But, <clears throat> yeah. And we don't want people to feel like that. So if you feel like that, imagine how the rest of your team feels. Like, maybe you're leading a part of the roadmap, and it's going really well, and the devs love you. But then your cohort is leading another part of the roadmap. And they're getting beat up left and right. People are complaining about that person. Um, their stuff's not getting done. Thank you. Their stuff's not getting done. You know, they have to report, oh, another week went by and I didn't make any progress. You need to help that person out. Because this is, we, we want this instead. Create this. Not this. Right? This. All right. How do we create this environment? The job's hard, we know that. And if you've done a good job with the roadmap, the prioritization exercise, scaring your executives, your budget, the doing part can be tough as well. So creating this is super important so that your guys don't have a nervous breakdown. They don't go back to whatever country they came from because it sucks so much here. Um, make sure that when you made that budget in the beginning, you need to make it fat enough to have, like send them to DEF CON, send them to Black Hat, Get training for them. Like, God, maybe they want SANS training. Maybe they want some certifications. You need to pay for that. So they need to grow as professionals as they're getting the crap beat out of them. So even if you have a small budget, maybe you can't send them to Black Hat. Maybe you don't have $6,000 for each person. But what you can do is, when they're having a bad day, take them to lunch. You know, buy them a beer if they don't drink. Make them a mocktail. You know, part out, there's Martinelli's and orange juice or something. Just acknowledge that their, their job is tough and you're there for them and tomorrow's going to be a better day and you've been there and then you could say, hey, next week when I'm having a shitty day, you can make me a mocktail. Um, so, yeah, another thing too, what my team does, um, maybe it's because I force them to, is we exercise together. <laughs> so uh, we run around the block and talk shit. Um, you can do that. You can, you know, cook dinner for each other. Those are all things that are free. And I would say, do the free things. Remember that these are human beings you're working with and they are suffering because their job, like your job, is a calling, which means that, you know, they have those sleepless nights too when they think about the thing that can't done. Are we being attacked? We didn't remediate this thing fully. Oh my God, are we gonna pass this audit? Like everybody's got that voice in their head. So remember, bring the calm. Make a conscious effort to do this every day if you can. Uh, and if you happen to be a leader of the security team, while, while your folks are working hard and executing on your roadmap, give them your time and attention. You know, always have a clear career path for them. Don't have them be like a mid-level engineer for four years, you know, without giving them a raise or with a path to promotion because you're a terrible boss, you know? <laughs> Sorry. Um, don't do that to people because that's how you would feel. You know, you've been busting your ass and what if the VP of engineering, he was your boss, was like, good job doing a good job. I don't care that you kept the lights on. Um, you don't want to be talked to like that, so don't pass that down to your team. All right. Okay, wrapping up. 
Again, most important part is before you roll out that program and hire the team, make sure the executives and R&D actually want your security. Then you roll out the plan. Um, I can't stress that enough because you will bang your head against a wall until your head is bloody. Make sure the execs want it and they're going to pay for it. And you'll know that they actually want it when they start repeating some of the things that you say. You know, they'll start catchphrases and you're like, oh, I caught you. I programmed you. That's how you know you want. Keep going until you win because you will. And also, um, once you have your security team from all over the world or wherever you get them, you better take good care of them because if you don't, someone else is going to. And remember that because that is the truth. All right. And that is it. Thank you very much. Salesforce is sponsoring a happy hour tomorrow at 8 o'clock right here. We also want to thank our sponsors, Verscript, HackerOne, and Fitbit. And actually, we have a special gift for our speaker, um, a brand new Fitbit Alta for her. So that's good information. Think about the CFP next year and see if you can be up on stage next year. Thank you.